Hi, everybody, and welcome to Resistance Recovery. Um, I am today conversing with Dr. Michael Cornwall, who is somebody whose uh, career I followed for a while. Um, I have quite a few things I'd like to ask him about. So before we start, Michael, maybe just you introduce yourself and where you're at and what you think is relevant. Thanks a lot, Pierce, for having me on. Um, and I'm glad to be here with your audience. I, I saw one of your videos where you said uh, um, you're an old war horse. So <laughs> I think we have that in common. Um, I'm a little longer in tooth than you, but uh, yeah, so I'm just someone who... Um, Started out thinking I'd have a normal life, you know, uh, back in the 60s and a lot happened. And so I'm, I'm here in the Bay Area and I've been a, a therapist now for about over 40 years, specializing in people who are going through madness or extreme states because I went through some of that myself back in the day, back when I was... Um, about 19 and got through it without getting locked up or medicated. I was able to stay at my grandmother's house, which was kind of a sanctuary. So uh, definitely was a sanctuary. And I had a real shift in uh, what I believed, what I uh, thought the world was about. We can go into that later maybe. But uh, so for the last 40 years here, I've been working with folks going through these hellish uh, experiences. Sometimes they're ecstatic, but they don't always stay that way. And um, in the Bay Area here, it was an amazing place back in the 70s and 80s because it was kind of a mecca for these, what I'd call sanctuaries where people could go through these processes without medication and in a, in a loving milieu. And maybe I could just give a little background on that, Piers, how that happened. Yeah, I really like that. That would be valuable to the audience, too. Well, I know you're always searching and trying to find what people need and um, thinking outside the box. I saw one of your recent things you were working with getting connected with the Boston Jungian Institute and trying to work with them. So it's always that possibility for some of us who see the need not being met. So to kind of start at the beginning of this for some of us here in the Bay Area, back in the 19, early 1970s, there was this major research project called the Agnews Project. And what it demonstrated was that people can go through these madness processes um, without medication in, in, in a supportive milieu. But it was down at the Agnew State Hospital here in California. And it came out of um, Esalen Institute was the spark plug for, for it. Esalen Institute, some people know, is kind of the beginning of the whole human potential movement with Abraham Maslow and some of those pioneers. Well, the guy who was the co-founder of Esalen was named Dick Price. And he was a psychiatric survivor himself. He came from a wealthy Midwest family and he got locked up for about a year. And they did all kinds of insulin shock and all kinds of stuff to him. So he came out here and hooked up with this other well-to-do guy, Michael Murphy, who owned all this family, owned this precious land down in Big Sur. And they got together and started this place down there, Esalen Institute, where all these people, Algis Huxley and Maslow and people came from all around the world to meet. But Price had a, had a mission, like his partner, Michael Murphy said, he wanted Esalen to be his revenge on the mental institution. Really? Yeah. So he, he got together with this, this guy, Julian Silverman, a psychiatrist from back east and they went to they put together this program i know you're always building programs and stuff so what it's like to get something off the ground they went to 
the California Institute, uh, California Mental Health and the Agnew State Hospital, and actually the Nash National Institute of Mental Health. Uh, back then, they, they got a major grant to do this uh, a double blind gold standard study randomly assigned where there was uh, over uh, three or four years, there was a, a large group of 40 in one group that didn't get Thorazine, the antipsychotic, and about 40 who did. And they were all in this, this milieu that John Perry was part of setting up around, you know. Uh, so was that first onset psychosis? Yeah. All, all participants? It was, yeah, it was about a, a diversion program. See, what, what, what would happen if we, from the first break of people, you offer them this alternative. So all, all the people were in that same milieu. They were still getting the same kind of uh, what Perry's whole uh, approach even before then was around connecting. But it was about the, and this is what, what a lot of my work is based on, the kind of the subjective experience, not only of the person going through that, but of the, the caregiver. What does the caregiver have to, how do they have to like orient themselves to be present with someone. And um, so that was the milieu they were in. And what was remarkable that uh, they did follow up study on that. And there was a, like a major research component in there, well funded. <clears throat> At three year follow up, the guys who didn't get the Thorazine had a 70% lower rehospitalization rate. So that was dramatic. It, it really said, like, not only as it turned the whole uh, kind of DSM schizophrenia diagnosis on his head because uh, you have to have these so-called symptoms for six months before you can earn that diagnosis of schizophrenia. Wow. So if you, if you go through this, this process and, and you aren't then symptomatic and you don't, or aren't having follow-up hospitalizations, you don't really deserve that label. So, um, not only that, but it, 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 it gave Perry um, the, the horsepower to be able to go to San Francisco and say, not only is this a humane thing, look, we can save all these people from being in the system probably for the rest of their lives, but it's going to be really cost effective. <laughs> You're going to start draining rain away a huge population of long-term people. So from that, he started that diabasis house in San Francisco. Uh, another guy that was down there, part of that Esalen, uh, Ag Agnews project was, that they, it was named Stanley Mayerson. And he, he went to Contra Costa County where I was working and ended up uh, opening a place similar to Diabasis, but it was bigger. It was like a 20 bed, uh, it was an old TB ward, opened it up, freestanding, no restraints, no diagnosis, no medication peers for eight years that place called I Ward was open and I wrote written about that and wow. so eight years of hundreds of people young people went through that and uh, I kind of started my whole uh, passage there when I went to work there go on that ward and you know 20 young people not all of them would be in the full blown at once but you'd have eight or ten who were in that state and it really just in, uh, impressed on me how powerful these uh, experiences are. There were all kinds of psychic things going on. Uh, people, people were in these, uh, for better word, uh, mythic archetypal possessions. Uh, the first person I was allowed to help there was a young woman I went back, she was, they said, she's back in the back day room. I went back there. She's standing on a table about this high, totally nude in this ecstatic state. Heavenly, heavenly, heavenly. You know, I'm going, oh my God, what if they didn't teach me this, anything about this in grad school. So I helped her get down off the table. And, you know, but she was a young mother, uh, all kinds of, we did family therapy on eyeboards. So we found out a lot, you know, about helping people through that family matrix but within a few, couple of days Piers her her ecstatic experience again about you know Perry's work he was a Jungian 
and all the, the archetypes, they, they really travel in pairs. You know, there's, it's the opposites. Right. Yeah. So she, she went from being, I am the, black, the bride of Christ and the Virgin Mary. I am the harbinger of you know, this ecstatic, beautiful. And then one day I came on and she goes, she turns to me, she goes, but on this hand, <laughs> and I go, whoa, <laughs> I didn't really pull back, but I'm standing. She goes, on this hand, I am the bride of Satan. And she yeah. leans forward, and the hair stood up on my neck. And she'd go, on this hand, I am, and, I, and then that, you, you know, you can't get any more of a graphic proof if you're looking for it about this stuff. It's powerful. And, it's, and I, I really believe that's part of why psychiatry, the whole, uh, mission of that part there's part of it is this uncanny power of the psyche when people are in these states uh is spooky it's scary you know it's it's like you know they used to like do exorcisms on people for this kind of stuff so anyway i worked there for about three and a half years and i'm were you a newly minted phd then or were you no i was uh actually a uh an MA uh, intern at that point. And, um, and at that point, I, I also had met John Perry. He came over to consult with us there. So Perry's uh, story is part of this whole Bay Area um, Mecca for people uh, going through these. There was another one down in San Jose called Soteria House that was based you might have heard that. And that. That was based on Lang's Kingsley Hall in London. So they had Soteria, who it was kind of this wide open kind of milieu. They didn't do family therapy. They didn't have Jungian therapy. Harry's was all Jungian. He believed, you know, people can go through these. You don't need family therapy. In fact, he he didn't want the families there. Uh, and I think that was a shortcoming of that. But I did my doctoral research on Diabasis House. So uh, it was very effective too. And then I ward, we did family therapy kind of from day one. And but we also had most of us there have this Jungian background too. So these three things operating at the same time in the Bay Area. So I met Perry and actually I was in analysis with him for four years. Wow. And uh, he was the first one after I'd gone through my travails up in Idaho <laughs> where I, you know, kind of dodged getting locked up. Uh, I'd never really been able to share that with anybody before. So it was a blessing to be able to be with him, you know, every week for four years. And uh, his whole approach here was so uh, influenced by his contact with Jung and also his, his Taoist uh, kind of conversion. Perry's father was the Anglican Bishop of the United States, kind of a patrician uh, Northeastern, you know, family there. Perry's grandfather was Commodore Perry, the guy who brought, you know, the, the Caucasians to Japan. Remember yeah. back in the day? Yeah. And so they had, they had a whole kind of legacy there of this family. And Perry's father had been over traveling in Europe and had sought out Jung uh, in the 30s and gone and met with Jung because he was worried about John, who was this kind of dreamer. And Jung said, well, maybe, he, you know, you should get him to go to med school. And uh, so Perry was going to Harvard and studying literature and, and everything. And actually, Perry had like a, a major kind of epiphany revelation that set his whole course. He'd been studying evolution and uh, all, all kinds of world history. He was really a, a brilliant guy. And he's, he'd been studying that for years. And before, while his father was over in Europe, Perry had this epiphany. He was there sitting on a hillside one day and he said he saw it all just come in on him at once that this whole uh, possibility that human evolution wasn't really a dead end, that, that, that the real goal of it was some kind of spiritual soul e expansion. It was very similar to that guy. I don't know if you heard of him, the, the Jesuit. Teilhard de Chardon had that, sure. that uh, yeah, that thing about the globe encircling consciousness of, of love. So Perry had that experience, and that uh, that was with him then when uh, 
he started on his journey with Jung. Uh, Jung came to the United States in 36 and stayed at the Perry's houses. House John picked Perry up. Uh, I mean, uh, Perry picked Jung up at the train station with his wife. He thought he was going to be this uh, very Germanic scholarly guy. And Jung's this big, boisterous, earthy, loud kind of guy. And around the dinner table that night, he's going on and on about myths, not but in this kind of hypnotic way. And Perry that night had this incredibly powerful dream and went to Jung the next morning, uh, you know, the dream master. And he said, oh, I had this dream. You were talking about dreams. Can I tell you? And Jung said, yes. So John says, well, I was in the living room of the house here, standing by the fireplace and bursting through the door was a, a wild Native American warrior just in a loincloth and he had a tomahawk. He threw it at me and just before it embedded in my chest, I caught it with both hands. And, and Jung let out this kind of mellow Perry said, and he says, yes, that's the wild man in you trying to get your attention. So that started his old thing with Jung back in 36. Then John went on to be get his medical degree and was a conscientious objector during World War II. He was in China uh, during uh, that horrible uh, invasion of China. Yeah, yeah. He said it was he was so he was part of the friends that the Quakers went over there. And they they set up these field hospitals in rural China. And he said it was such a cultural difference. I mean, it's like they were kind of in this pre-industrial mode of living there. And the whole kind of Taoist uh, practice was real. He said, you know, they go into the, 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 the elders were there. They're going, okay, we're here. We're going to set up the hospital. Where should we do it? And they go, uh, we'll let you know when it's time. They go, no, no, people are dying. You got to help. You know, you go, no, we'll let you know. You know, <laughs> it was like, uh, and so actually some people, some of these, said some of the, the people there that were part of that medical kind of mash unit lost it. They couldn't handle it. It's just not just the war, but just the whole kind of, whoa, where am I? They had to like, they said he wrapped them up in sheets and sent them back to the United States. So after that experience, he was a heavyweight by then. He got back and then he went to Zurich to be with Jung. And um, Jung knew him from before. And instead of him being an analysis with Jung, Jung did this unparalleled thing. He said, you know, um, I want you to come and meet with me alone every couple of weeks for an hour or so, and we'll just talk. And so that was an invaluable thing. And then said, Jung said, I want you to be in a, a dual analysis, one with Tony Wolf, which was Jung's fabled mistress, uh, who had been a patient of his. That's one of the shadow things on the young community forever. And then uh, another guy, C.A. Meyer. So Perry was there. And then he came back from the from uh, there. And so I, I had some really cool, strong questions for John when I was interviewing him for my diabetes research about that period and about him coming back from Zurich. And he said, you know, he didn't himself become psychotic or mad but he said it was so intense. He said, when I got back to the United States, it was like someone could just put their hand through me. That's how wide open he was. But he said, then I went to start working in these hospitals and the people who had been, you know, locked up for some time being psychotic, he said, when I would be with them, because I was just so wide open, they'd start responding to me and they started getting better. So that was kind of his beginning proof that this kind of practice of being with someone, not seeing them as uh, mentally ill or uh, diseased model. I know you had Whitaker on a few months ago and he really talked about that, that change in paradigm with, when you stop seeing people through that psychiatric disease lens. So Perry started doing that and then he, he uh, got involved in the Agnes project and then went, went on to create Diabasis House, which was um, a huge success in terms of helping people. Uh, um, a couple questions, and, and just correct me if I'm wrong. Did Perry come back here with this attitude that he was going to put Jung's theory to the test, meaning 
the psychotic states or the psyche trying to reorganize themselves at a higher level. And he, he, he was going to practice that in a way that no Jungian really had prior to that. I don't think he came back with that notion, but he said, as soon as he started being with people in these, in these situations, some of it was uh, uh, at McLean's hospital. Uh, oh, he, he saw, he, he saw firsthand that he was having responses to people and they were responding to him in this way that was to him, it, it was really revolutionary. So, so I think from, from his actual in vivo experience of doing it, then he says, wow. Uh, and so it wasn't long after that in the 1951, he, he wrote uh, a book called The Self and Psychotic Process based on his just a few years of doing that. And, and Jung wrote the foreword to it. And um, Jung gave him some credit there. Uh, he said, you know, uh, as he often did too, he says, you know, you know, Dr. Perry is carrying out my <laughs> ideas on all this, but he, he also said, you know, he's breaking some new ground too. So he, he really was breaking new, some new ground. And yeah, because I feel like he, um, he predates all this uh, spiritual emergency Stan Groff kind of stuff. And he, he was so, uh, you know, I've only read Trials of the Visionary Mind. Uh -huh. I've read it more than once. And I actually taught it in a psychopathology class. Wow. And what struck me about him was he seemed to be earlier. Um, and he was so elegant. His, his thinking and writing, his style. Yeah. Was so yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And then the other thing that struck me is when you're studying transpersonal psychology, his name doesn't really come up. They act like everything started after him in the 60s or something, and it just seems so wrong. It, it does, and it's, it's unfortunate because it's a loss. And um, I, I, you know, I'll, I can speak to that. Part of that was because he uh, transgressed, and he was uh, on kind of an invisible blacklist not only in the in the broader Jungian community but he was kind of radioactive uh, when I first went to be in analysis with him I'd seen him he'd come over to talk to us on iWord um, I said that's the guy I want to be with he'll, he'll know what I went through so I, I went to in the, the first uh, session I'm sitting there and I said uh, never to be shy. I said, so John, I, I heard you just got expelled from the um, San Francisco Jung Institute for uh, ethical violation with one of your female clients, patients. And uh, he's very soft-spoken and kind of sitting there with his pipe looking back at me and he goes, well, they did call me up and um, for all of them, and I, um, I, I, I wouldn't recant, and so I'm, yeah, I'm no longer there. He just said, "So, Michael, you think that will be a problem?" And being a wise ass and knowing, knowing that young, young had slept with his patients, uh, not that I was ever wanting to do that, but I said, you know, uh, well, if I wanted purity, I would have gone to a priest. And uh, that's how it's turned. But, yeah. But he... But that, he was, that was the real reason why he was blacklisted? Or was absolutely. there that the pretext for some... Were there other things going on? Oh, you froze up. Oh, no. Well, uh, it was a huge loss for the whole Young, young Institute in San Francisco. He, he'd been one of the founding members of that. And in fact, you know, there, there's kind of a synchronicity of us talking right now because just last month, the leading uh, Jungian journal, Journal of Analytic Psychology, has this whole edition that's just almost all about Perry. Uh, there's uh, some two articles in there from this group in Palermo 
of these kind of straight psychiatrists, psychologists, somebody read one of Perry's books and had the started light going on. And so they're wanting to do a whole kind of diabetes thing there in Palermo. And one of Perry's main articles called the reconstitutive processes in the psychopathology of the self, that's republished there. And then Gene Kirsch, one of the analysts from San Francisco, Young Institute wrote a personal kind of uh, response about Perry and talked about his transgressor and talking about her being in the meeting where they indefinitely suspended him and and all that. It was interesting that in none of those articles that just came out of this whole kind of new revival of Perry, was there any mention about my diabetes research, which was <laughs> the one, again, it was like the revision of history. Like she, she didn't even mention diabetes. I mean, I've, I've talked a lot with Gene after that, but there's this whole kind of thing when something happens that's scary, right? People kind of come up with their own way of adapting to it. So for years, I mean, the, the truth is, Piers, for the last 40 years, I mean, everybody knew that Perry's work and Perry was Jung's heir apparent on madness and psychosis and Jung's main chops was made, were made around the whole psychosis stuff. Yeah. All the Jungians knew that for, for 40 years. Only one guy who had been in analysis with Perry called John, named John Beebe, you might have heard of him, very prominent Jungian. He, he wrote a, he wrote a, a forward to, to the, uh, like the fifth edition of Perry's book, The Far Side of Madness, where he said, you know, John was this elegant, uh, sensitive man, and he had this whatever he had, but he was, you know, but his, his work is still valuable. And as you know, uh, what came out of my, my dissertation, my, my doctoral research, the extensive interviews of Perry and all the staff and Perry gave me all the records of diabetes, all the stuff, you know, letters from Gregory Bateson saying you should do this. Perry was able to go to the city fathers in San Francisco and sell this. And, uh, and but I was able to find one, this was like, 30 years after diabetes, find one resident who went through it, a wonderful woman who'd uh, been kind of pushed into being in law school by her family, uh, right at the juncture where she passed the bar exam, was going to be a lawyer. She broke down and went through this whole thing and went to diabetes, came out the other side, and, and she was an artist. She never practiced law. Her soul wanted her to be an artist. So I interviewed her. So it's all in my my research, but the, the central finding of my research was that there, there's a way, and it corresponds very completely to kind of the Taoist way and Perry's way of, I know you saw some of that in Prowl's The Visionary Mind about that way of being with someone, not so much focusing on what's wrong with them, but how can the caregiver orient themselves to be in this loving, open-minded, open-hearted way. That's right there. That's the nexus. That's where the transaction happens, right. where the healing happens. In fact, uh, recently I've been uh, a guest editor for the Journal of Humanistic Psychology for two, uh, two volumes where there's been like 26 authors worldwide that I've got to do this on I pose this question that all the authors had to, had to answer. Mm. If, if madness isn't what psychiatry says it is, then what is it? And if it's not what psychiatry says it is, then how's the best way to respond? And then I was able to write my article and saying, merciful love, and the title of my article is, merciful love can heal the emotional suffering of extreme states. So I took Perry's, bold kind of thing I talked about loving receptivity and for years I've been doing these workshops and stuff about love itself that we experience for someone it doesn't have to be erotic and it shouldn't be overtly erotic but but that heartfelt feeling that people uh, experience uh, that was the central finding in my dissertation that there's a way that caregivers can be with someone that really helps and I've seen it over and over, there's all kinds of examples that I'm sure in your work, you've been sitting with someone and feeling, feeling that caring for them 
and you can feel something palpable shift in the room. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that soul, yeah. that, soul, that in, kind of intangible thing that we all need when we're really up against it. Yeah, and unfortunately, no clinical training seems to address that, much less use the term soul, um, now anyway. So what happened with Perry's losing the funding? Uh, the house, the program ran for quite a few years and then they lost funding, is that right? That's right. And again, it wasn't, you know, a headline funding cut because of John Perry's transgressions, but everybody knew uh, he was toast at that point. It, w it wasn't going to be uh, re refunded. Uh, but, you know, he didn't just disappear. I mean, because of his value of his, his work, he did uh, all kinds of, he, he was even a, a guest le lecturer at the Langley Porter Institute. I was, you know, I, I, he was my friend and mentor for about 20 years. I was going over to his house and hanging out and stuff. And he was still, he was invited because of his connection to China to go over there, wow. to Peking, Peking University and teach all this stuff. Uh, at his memorial service, some big guy from China came over and spoke at his memorial service. Perry, you know, uh, he was he was one of my clinical supervisors at California Institute of Integral Studies. He was like, he was still uh, involved, in, but he he wasn't a Jungian uh, analyst. And uh, the the really sad part was it was. Two or three years before he died, I went over to his house, and it happened to be the same day I came in, and he was—it was just ashen face. And he said, "Well, Michael, I guess I'm going to be assigned to do." And it was, he was—he wasn't a sarcastic or ironic guy. He says, "I guess I'm going to be assigned to be doing from now on some kind of new age spiritual counseling." He said because. They just took away my medical license. Oh wow! So wow. he couldn't. He couldn't stop that. And you know, I have my own theory about why he and Jung both couldn't uh, keep their Hippocratic oath. I don't know if you're licensed, but I am. And I mean, it's, it's like every year I got to go and take those uh, ethic courses that say, you know, dual relationships, thou shalt not. But right. uh, so anyway, he, uh, it's tragic that, that that's what happened to him. But uh, R.D. Lang, who was another <clears throat> pioneer and all that, he lost his medical license for a not sexual indiscretion, but for, a, a understand, throwing a whiskey bottle at one of his detractors' houses. Well, he was he was a lot more outlandish than Perry probably yeah. ever. But That's at, right. at the same time, Mosier would lose funding for Soteria as well. Is that right? In that same time frame? or No, it wasn't the same time. It, M Mosier kept uh, funding for Soteria well into the 80s. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, no, he was... He was kind of hanging on that down there going, I'm, I'm clean, I'm clean. You know, they, he was, uh, I mean, the, the guy that I told you about, Stanley Marison, who uh, founded iWard, he got busted and got fired for having one of the psychiatrists uh, prescribe unlimited amounts of Ritalin that he was chopping up and putting up his nose. So he got busted and got fired. So it's like all these guys, it's like a in, in my dissertation I write, is a cautionary tale. When you're around this unmedicated madness, that whole kind of Dionysian energy of wildness and uncivilized and all of this, you know, we got to rebel against this wasteland. We're the wild ones, right? We're going to do what we want to do. It's a cautionary tale to, to, to really have some kind of grip on something. I've seen a lot of people. I mean, Pierce, when I went for my job interview on iWard, the, the psychiatrist, they had to have a psychiatrist there just because of the license, although we didn't diagnose anyone or medicating. They were just kind of like walking around. But the guy who interviewed me, he says, you know, 
uh, Michael David Cooper, who's uh, Artie Lang's partner over there in Kingsley Hall, was just here doing a week-long in-service with our staff. And he said, he was telling the staff, you must be able, be willing to have sex with your patients to rid them of the colonialism that has been imposed on them and da da, da you know, and, you know, and, and so the, this guy in, in a job, in a civil service job interview leans forward to me and goes, so Michael, um, how about you? Will you have sex with the patients as Dr. Cooper? It was exhorting a student. I go, no, sir, I, I won't. He said, what about kissing him? One of the staff here took Dr. Cooper's and he was like, we found him kissing one. Will you kiss your pa the patients? I go, no, sir, I won't. So it was crazy, you know. Yeah, it was a different time, obviously. It was. Yeah. But I I'm assuming, too, that with Perry and Mosier and company, the winds of change as we entered in the 80s and the DSM-3, and uh, that all will suddenly show up and we're, we're medicalizing everything and, and they get kind of pushed under the rug. Is that, is that a safe way? Yeah, that's... I'm really glad to say that because that it's not just about Perry and Stanley Marison messing up. I ward stayed open for like three or four years after Marison was disgraced. So what what you're talking about now is the winds of change is a huge was that was the the the, the true death knell because what happened was as you've seen in your whole universe of treatment, big pharma and psychiatry got together. So the staff psychiatrists there and the leading psychiatrists of the hospital always saw I Ward as like this thorn in their side, you know, that somehow got, you know, introduced into this traditional mental health system. It was at the hospital. There was a J board a hundred yards from I Ward where there was eight beds with people tied down in seven point restraints and shot full of Haldol, you know? So it was like, which, which model is gonna win out here? And so at, at that time there was this kind of, I've written about it, in fact, I wrote an article called, I would, sometimes the title of my articles, look back and go, woo. It was like, eyewitness to the ruination of a public mental health system was the title of my article, where that this unholy alliance of big pharma, psychiatry and couldn't have done them without them, NAMI, National Alliance of the Mentally Ill. Yep. They all got together because a lot of people, you know, in this whole movement didn't spend, like I spent 28 years in that system. I was never promoted. I was a line therapist for 28 years, every day for 40 hours a week, seeing people. I was involved in the union. I was always an agitator and stuff. But that's where you saw all this stuff get operationalized that Bob Whitaker was talking about, where you actually see one day uh, Prozac doesn't exist. The next day, one day Zyprexil and Clausril, the antipsychotics aren't there. The next they are. One day, uh, you know, in, in the whole system where there's hundreds of children and teens in the system, only maybe five or six of them are getting Ritalin. But when by the time I left, 95% of them were on Ritalin and anti antipsychotics. So NAMI was crucial, peers, in terms of that grassroots board of supervisors. I'm sure when you go to try and fund programs and get stuff cleared, there's all the NIMBYism, there's all five different layers of political people have to sign off or can nuke it. So NAMI with the support of psychiatry and big pharma were really the, the point of the spear. They would go into every county supervisor's uh, office. And you have to have five, you have to have three votes out of five to do anything in these, in these counties. And they sit down with them. The first thing they say is, we have so-and-so this many registered NAMI members in your district. And we're asking you, and it was tragic because they, they would always say, this 
my son or my daughter committed suicide in your mental health system, what are you gonna do about it? We need more psychiatrists, we need more medication, we need forced treatment, we need forced medication because these, our young ones are not getting the help we need. And so then I'm, I'm there with the mental health coalition when the NAMI contingent leaves that supervisor's meeting, I go in with another group and say, I know you what you just heard, but we, we're, we're asking you to put together the, the, these peer programs you know, the, the, you know, these like non, so anyway, you can see you kind of put a nickel in me and I go on and on, but, no, no, no. but, but uh, that was, that was huge in the eighties. And then and, and Reagan too, that whole kind of chilling thing from the top down is yeah. like. End of community mental health and all that. Um, so when did you leave that job? What year? Um, 2007. So you, you were literally on the ground through the whole change. Absolutely, yeah. And the change was really 85, 6, 4? That's when it really, when when I Ward closed, I think around uh, 84 or 5, Mosier and, and people down in San Jose, I think, hang on all into the, the late uh, 80s. But then it was, it was just like this, I mean, we fought back. We had this mental health coalition. We were, you know, pushing back. We had some some really strong consumers, uh, you know, psychiatric survivors. There was a real hotbed of that, but it was it was a, a losing battle. It was a rear guard battle every day. Uh, well, you, you have know. a war chest, right? Yeah, I mean, you I, have a war chest. You can't fight. I mean, I remember the, the last twelve years of my stay there. I was, uh, I mean, for for years, I was on the streets on a, a mobile crisis team with mm -hmm. all the people who were you know, out there. So, you know, when you, when you do that kind of work out there with no net and out there, uh, but, but bringing that same kind of heart centered connection and we saw dramatic results, you know, but then the last few years I was there, I was in a children and adolescent clinic. And at some point NAMI shifted out, they'd done as much as they could in California to get legislation passed, the Bronson legislation that says only mental health dollars that are going towards the severely and persistently mentally ill are going to pre-prioritize. I mean, at one point that was going to mean cutting all the therapists out of adult services. I did a voter no confidence petition on the mental health director and circulated it. Uh, uh, actually, it, it, it stopped that from happening for about a year. He lost his job. So we were fighting him like tooth and nail all the way. But, you know, at some point, uh, especially in children's services, the last 12 years I was working there. At some point, NAMI's decided now we're gonna go after the, the children adolescent services, right? That was a major shift. From now on, only the people that they're telling people that you can trust are child psychiatrists to do a full psychiatric evaluation. And so they would bring in all their literature to, to the waiting room of our clinic, you know, printed by yours truly, you know, Lily or Pfizer, right? I mean, right. they had a they had a full time, world class. Washington D.C. lobbyists working for NAMI, the, the drug companies, did, you know, through all that. Uh, and, so they, they 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 bring in this literature. I see it. I tell the secretary whenever they bring that in, let me let me know. She was a good friend of mine. They they come in with their little brochure stands and stuff. It'd be there for about two hours. I'd go get it. What did I do with it? Throw it in the garbage can. You know, so it was like this guerrilla warfare, but God, we were never going to win. It must have taken a toll on you. It did, my friend. Especially the yeah. kids, you know, that's that's the hardest part. Oh, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, little kids on Seroquel is a horrible thing. When you think your heart's broken, like one family came in with a little girl. One of the psychiatrists there, and again, I was working every day with these psychiatrists. And so, you know, they were just doing what they'd been told and taught to do. And she was afraid because she'd over-medicated this, this, this female psychiatrist was afraid she over-medicated this little girl who was six years old. Comes in, the family's little girl sitting there, weighs about 60 pounds. She's kind of, oh, oh. You, know, you know, it's like this. I'm like, oh my God, and the family, the mom and dad. They said, well, doctor, so and so would refer to us here. They think maybe you can make uh, do some help. And I said, "Well, 
yeah, I, I'd really like to, and you know, I can start seeing her individually, and then I'd like to like meet with you, and you know, maybe we can do some, you know, this kind of family therapy. And they had it rehearsed. The, the, the mother looked at the father and she says, "Well, actually, it's a lot better now. She doesn't throw tantrums and she sleeps at night, and because." The psychiatrist said, she does have a brain disease. I said, well, I really don't think so. Uh, you know, Dr. Cornwall, we don't think we need your help. We don't need family therapy. She doesn't need therapy. We're, we're just going to stick with the medications. So we're going to leave her. They get up and walk out, and the little girl's kind of staggering out of the room. At that point, I almost like put my fist through the wall, man. It was like, what the fuck? And but I was like crying and, and wanting to break stuff at the same time. Yeah. So you've been there. Yeah, I have. I, some, I've heard Bregan one time talk about it as a kind of a spellbinding effect. And it's not just on the client, it's also on the family members where the narrative is so strong that in the, the power dynamics and differentials are so powerful that People don't believe what's right in front of their face. A drooling child. A yeah, drooling I. Parent child. I was angry at everybody then, but you know, I, I don't blame the families. Like you said, there it's like. Uh, in fact, I wrote an article about how loving parents can prescribe, you know, you know, have their kids on these these drugs. It's like it's, it's the deck is so stacked. You yeah. know, the, who who are they going to believe me? Or, or, you know, the powers that be, the psychiatrists, the experts, uh, you know, it, it's like that's, it's, it is a spell man. It, it's like everybody's in the, the, this trance of, yeah. uh, of, of, avoid, of avoiding emotion. I mean, my main thing over the years is it's all about emotion. It's about <laughs> the whole project is, you know, emotion causes disruptive behavior. Emotion scares people. In fact, these trainings I've been doing at Esalen Institute and grad schools and the APA and everywhere, it's this little exercise I do where it's the caregiver being there and the person expressing some emotion. And even just the words, maybe if you want to at the end, we could do it, it only take five minutes. But it's, it's this powerful thing is about how we all can live with other people's and our own intense emotions. I mean, you see it every day. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a long time person in recovery. So I know my uh, passage through <laughs> addiction was for me, just speaking for me, was always about can I stop what I'm, the emotions I'm feeling right now? I need to, I need to not feel this right now. Definitely, definitely. And then, and then the system now is essentially cognitive behavioral. So it's all oh, about God. thinking and sobriety and they leave the motion to the psychiatrist and it's, it's just a mess. Well, at what point did you, did you do both your uh, graduate degrees at CIIS? No, I did uh, the first one at JFK University, and it was oh, a dual. It was a dual degree. Dual, it was transpersonal psychology and and uh, regular clinical. I mean, I was when I went through my whole process up there. I was homeless for sometimes. I was really messed up, and at one point, uh, I got it together enough, and I could, you know, I you know, I'm sure your story has some same lines. You know, I want to try and help people. Uh, get out of the hell I was in. So I was I was on the fast track to be an Episcopal priest. I was on my way to seminary and all that. And my spiritual advisor, I think you're a spiritual advisor too, this great guy, uh, he was a non-stipendiary priest. He knew me well. He says, you know, Michael, don't do it. He said, <laughs> he said, he said you're too rebellious for one thing. And he said, you don't want to be in this church marrying and burying them and having these old farts telling you what to do he says you know go down to the bay area there's this place called jfk and you can you can do your whole soulful thing is this dual degree transpersonal psychology so i went there and started and when did you go to ciis 
that was later on. That was in, um, yeah, I think that was the early 90s. So that was towards the end. Well, that was after the shifts towards meds and psychiatry. So you go to CIIS. I suppose that would be uh, a bomb to your soul, at least to do that. It was because they had a Jungian track there and there was some really strong Jungian, uh, some Tanya Wilkinson is an author, she's a, a Jungian, Perry was doing clinical uh, supervision there and everything. Uh, I must say CIS is a mixed bag. We, I used to call it the Space, the space Academy because I mean, and it, it had a real high kind of uh, new age narcissistic quotient too, you know. Uh, but there were some real solid people there too. And so I got what I- and Dermot president at the time? He Robert. was, I think, when I first started, yeah. Yeah, I studied with him a little bit. Did you? Yeah. Some of those guys were solid, but uh, yeah, so- uh, Well, it has an exalted reputation. At least on the East Coast it does. Does it? Yeah, it, it is deserving. It's. Uh, You know, it, it was started out the Institute of Asian Studies. They had some heavy hitters there, that whole uh, in, integral psychology. I think it was body, mind, and soul, and spirit. It was, uh, it's, to this day, it's very valuable. What, 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 became, what happened after you, you left the hospital? Did you become more of an activist and a private clinician or? You mean after I left the county? Yeah. Yeah, well, I became, uh, there was a lot of pent up need I, I found to like uh, express the activism in a, in a way of, of writing and training. And yeah, I've always kept my private practice. I'm still seeing people in extreme states every week. So, uh, but I started doing these trainings down at Esalen Institute mm -hmm. and kind of revived that whole Dick Price founder uh, uh, movement down there. I've done several, I did two week long, led two week long conferences down there on revisioning madness. And then several uh, weekend work with David Lukoff. I don't know if you've heard of him, but oh, uh, yeah. So, a lot of uh, a lot of that, and then uh, Les Whitaker, you know, back in 2012, he invited me to start writing there on Mad in America. So I've just finished my 50th article on Mad in America. <laughs> so right. I've been like, I've been like, you know, I thought I was going to have. Okay, I'm just going to go out to pasture. I mean. Uh, Actually, that's when I got sober too, Pierce, after I quit. Uh, you know, so it's been over 10 years now. Uh, you know, who knows, but. Well, Michael, we need you. Um, we certainly need people that have the kind of roots that you have and who are one eyewitnesses to the changes that have happened in the system, you know, and yeah. also the fact that you were right there, boots on the ground in that moment in time where a Soteria house could happen, you know, I mean, to somebody my age, it's almost unbelievable that it ever did happen. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, well, I'm still, been still been fighting to get them open again for Several years, I was part of this group here in the Bay Area called the Mandala Project. And we were really in uh, with Alameda County Mental Health and meeting with the mental health director and really kind of bring, we had the whole vision, we had a whole alternative thing and um, almost got it, almost got it. And then there was another one, uh, this Nassos Project with a bunch of these Langians, Michael Guy Thompson, and some of those people with Lang over there, I've been involved with them for several years, the last few years, we have these conferences down at week-long conferences at Esalen around the whole Lang legacy. So 
and you know we've been trying for six years to get a kind of a, a Langian house open here. It's so hard. I mean, yeah. if you if you try and do it in house like we did at Alameda County, then you're faced with the same thing. You know, you get a new mental health director and goes, "What the hell are you doing here?" And they cut it. Or if you you try and get uh, completely off the grid like we were with the Langian folks in San Francisco, and we're still trying uh, to get the funding for it. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. I've dealt with that. Um, I was I was the chair of the Department of Transpersonal Psychology at, at Burlington College the last three years it was open. And they got a Soteria house open in Burlington, but it was really quickly co-opted. I mean, the meds just kind of creeped their way in there and it became oh, yeah. 180 from what it was intended to be. Yeah. Sad. I mean, my experience has been that I've, um, I've started a retreat or I was a player started a retreat, but we were completely off the grid. So we operated under a bed and breakfast license. Huh? <laughs> we had yeah. no clinical at all. And, um, but only wealthy people could afford it. So no yeah. matter, we appeased our conscience by giving away as much services as we could, yeah. but in the last analysis, you're really treating that narrow bandwidth of people who can afford you. That's what happens. And uh, I think you've had some collaboration with Beatrice Birch and Inner Fire. Yeah, sure, I'm on the board. Yeah, well, yeah. that was, Beatrice was at some of these gatherings I put together at Esalen and stuff. I mean, she was talking about a bulldog. She, she had that vision for years before she got that thing off the ground, right? Right, but she still has the same issues. And some people, she has detractors because of it, the cost. Oh. So, but I, I, I really appreciate her work. Yeah. Um, so I, I just want to turn the conversation a little bit. Um, yeah. I'm reading this book that is just blowing my mind. It's called uh, Caring for Souls in a Neoliberal Age. Oh. And what he's saying in here is he's saying, and he's historically, he's sort of dating neoliberalism starting around 1980 with Reagan, kind of arbitrary, but more or less accurate. And what he's saying is he's saying that we are seeing a new subjectivity now. We're seeing people that are coming to us. He's also a clinician. They're coming to us with a different, the, the suffering has changed. And he's talking about people in terms of, uh, the phrases he uses are like disembedded individuality, wow. um, liquid, kind of a liquid sense of self, um, homo economicus, homo consumerus. And when we've been so molded into this thing, it makes resistance that much harder. Um, and, and I'm certainly seeing this with my clients. Yeah. Are you seeing something comparable? Yeah, and um, maybe I can touch back on Perry because I know you get what he is trying to do. That's, to me, what's going on right now fits with what some part of Perry's work that has gotten very little attention uh, speaks to is that he believed from his really extensive, his scholarship and everything around cultural evolution that we're, we're at the point where a, a new myth form is, is arising and the old one is dying. And, and he's not talking about some you know, little harmonic conversions or new age, you know, thing. He's talking about the major and a cataclysmic event when a new myth form is dying and then and the, the, the other one is coming up over the hill and we can't, can't even see it yet. And uh, appears it was a couple of years before he's died, we were talking about this. And what year did he die? 
uh, 98. He said, Michael, I so wish that I could live till, till about, God, this is, till about 2016 or 17. He says, that's when you're really going to see the shift. He said, you're, you're going to be here. And he says, what you're, what you're, what, you who are going to be alive then are going to see this beginning of the wheel really turning. And he said, it's going to be chaos. I mean, you know, he wasn't into most Dama's prediction, but he said, you know, and when we look, when we look out now and just, you know, this whole Trump thing wasn't about Trump. It was about this whole huge collective, you know, shift and the, the glue is looser. I mean, we've had all these prophets of saying, you know, the center will not hold. The wasteland can only be a wasteland for so long. Uh, but Perry said, you know, this new myth form is coming. And he, he said, like in any culture, when we can look back and see where these breakthroughs happening, we have these visionary experiences, our dreams shift, our unconscious, you know, the, the whole kind of fluidity, the, the, the whole kind of waking uh, position, locus of control loses, loses its power in the face of this upwelling of all this collective stuff. And he said, you know, so you're going to see stuff that you won't believe you're going to see. So when we look out now and see, you know, like an insurrection at the cap, you know, all this stuff. And then uh, it's, it's kind of like a collective meltdown. Does that relate to what a little bit you, yeah. you're, you're saying yeah. in that book? It sure does. It sure does. And I have clients that show up and they've, um, especially if they're millennials, They've never been alive when there wasn't digital culture. Yeah. And they've never been alive when there wasn't an opioid epidemic. Yeah. And I was talking to a philosopher who said to me, he says, uh, they have no contrasting set, yeah. right? So you and I can, we can say, you know, everybody at the dinner table going like this, how strange that is, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, we can talk about how our drug addiction took us away from our, our relationships and our interests. Yeah. But this is a group of people who have been shaped and molded by either psychiatric drugs, illicit drugs, both, yeah. and digital devices, and they have no reference point. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. But maybe that's, you know, that kind of humanity necessarily show up in a time like Perry described? I think so. I think that um, it's, it's not just that the archetypal stuff is shifting at this tech common level, but everything that's standing on it is too. It's, it's all uh, yeah. up for grabs. And so all this stuff that even five, 10 years ago would have seen even kind of anomalous and too far out. Now we kind of, I mean, don't we all kind of wake up and each day and go, what the hell, you know, something just happened, you know? You yeah, know? that sounds like our staff meetings when we're, going, <laughs> we're doing all the cases and we're like, you know, yeah. stuff we've never even imagined. I mean, the way I kind of keep my pulse on it is uh, with people's dreams, it, it, people who, or even in these really active psychotic processes, that that's one thing that Perry said. Where I kind of advanced his work some, he, he he'd never done dream work with people who were so-called chronics. He always right. focused on the individual, you know, the acute. But because I was there, hunkered down at the county level, after all this stuff was stripped away, these people who had come in who had been in the system for years, I would start. You know, to the terror of my clinical supervisor, start asking them about their dreams and doing this kind of, you know, like like Perry. What is not, doing now? Yeah, what's he doing? Oh, uh, you can't, you know, elicit that unconscious content, you know. But, but well, guess what? That unconscious content was just waiting to come up, and it's right. the the emotions. Uh, even these people. I, when I heard you talk about the millennials in one of your YouTube, I said, I wonder what their dreams are like 
because where, where it's happening is the surface is like everybody's kind of hypnotized and blah, blah, blah. but below we all still have that same psychic inheritance and i wonder what their dreams are like because i found when doing those asking people who had been in the system what their dreams were you know if it, it would usually take two or three weeks or so and then but every session i'd ask did you have any dreams oh no and then come back i had a dream and so the dreams would start and the dreams you know one thing that Perry, I think, is a huge accomplishment, and he just hadn't gotten credit for yet, was he redefined archetype peers to be affect image, a affect image. An ar archetype is an affect image. So first, we look at what the affect is. I mean, the whole Jungian thing has been so influenced of course, by Jung and Hillman and everybody, like, let's look at the images. I mean, there's one guy who wrote a book, Imagination is Reality. So for me, it's always been about the gut level emotion and then the, the words and the images form out of that. But so Perry says, I, an archetype is an affect image, image. So when people have dreams, the affect is creating the images. In fact, one of the main things that John shared with me that he said, he said it was the most important teaching that Jung gave him over those years when he was there with Jung as his mentor. And I've never seen it written up anywhere else. I wrote it up on Mad in America of all places. Mm -hmm. This should have been front and center in some Jung journal. But anyway, then all, the, all this stuff. Uh, Jung uh, took Perry aside and he said, you know, what I want to share with you is this dream teaching Person, a personal dream teaching that Jung had that showed this thing around affect and images. He said, for years, I've been having this terrifying nightmare, recurring nightmare. Jung is telling Perry this, where a, a menacing dragon breaks in and is coming after me and I'm terrified, I'm terrified. And I always wake up like in a cold sweat and the dragon's after me. And Jung being the genius that he was, he said one time, just, I was in this kind of reverie, kind of meditating on this dream, and it came to me in an instant. The emotion that I was feeling in that dream, that terror, is what happens every time my mother-in-law walks in the room. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. And he had good reason to be afraid of his mother-in-law who knew that Carl was forcing Emma to his wife sit there at the same table with his mistress, Tony Wolf, right? Right. And so what Jung passed on to Perry was, he said, all this dream analysis is going on, just break it down to this. What is the affect in the dream that's creating the image and then look out in your waking life and see where that affect re resides. Because mm. when you look out in your waking life and see what that affect, that, that emotion you had last night in the dream, you'll be able to know where in your life there's an archetypal presence breaking in because the affect is so strong. I mean, that's kind of my theory about psychosis and madness and all suffering is like when the, when the affect gets to a certain point for anyone, the archetypal stuff starts constellating. It, 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 the affect, the yeah. affect bring, the affect brings it on, you know. Well, it, it, it reminds me of, um, believe it or not, poetry and sacred text. Yeah, the words are so evocative that maybe the artist is really working with the affect and giving a form on, on an unconscious inspiration. Yeah. Yeah, and even when we hear some of our most powerful artists and singers and, yeah. you know, they say, don't ask me to interpret you or tell you what it means. All I'm trying to do is get an emotional response from people, right? Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. Well, Michael... This has been wonderful. Um, now I'm inclined to uh, 
read more Perry titles and read more Cornwall articles on Madden and America. And maybe in a few months, we'll do another round of this. That'd be great. It'd be agreeable. Absolutely, because in a few months, it's going to be even weirder. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure of that. I am sure of that. Well, I'm really glad I reached out. And thank you so much. Thank for you, my friend. All thank right. You. Peace. Peace. Yeah. <laughs> okay.